Hello friends, Killer Bee here. So how does a railroad know how much it costs them to move a car? I don't mean the rate, I mean what is their expense. I have found determining this an interesting exercise. Knowing your cost is crucial so you can determine if a given move is making you money or not. This video will dive into some of the concepts. Plus, I'll tell you some of my favorite costing stories, which bring the concepts to life. Let's say, hypothetically, the cost to run a train from yard A to yard B is $1,000. This represents the crew wages, locomotive ownership and maintenance costs, fuel, car hire on foreign cars, car ownership costs, the cost of the tail end marker, etc all the costs directly associated with running the train. Let's say it is 100 cars, all loads. In effect, the cost that should be allocated to each car is $10. If the train had only been 50 loaded cars, the cost per car would be $20. Thus, the desire for a railroad to run long trains. The revenue on each car would be unchanged, so with the longer train yielding less cost per car, the profitability of each car rises. But this is a simple example. There are some real rabbit holes we can go down. For instance, we have wear and tear being inflicted on the track. There may be no direct track expense attributable from running our train from A to B over it, Thus seemingly nothing to add to our per car cost, we figured. But at some point, eventually, ties and rail will have to be replaced, servicing done, etc. Ideally, these costs can be captured and divided by the number of cars traveling over the line to get a per car track maintenance cost. However, just grabbing all the cost inputs to figure this will be a challenge. How much should be allocated toward the cost of the track machinery that worked on the track for a week to replace ties? How about fuel for the machines? Repairs to them? The cost of labor that operates the machines? It's not just their wages, but you also have to take into account their fringe benefits they receive, such as, say, any company paid insurance, for instance. There are trucks which have their own ownership expense, plus periodic maintenance, oil changes, tire replacement eventually, insurance, gas, etc. And don't forget the line probably has a section gang, who also has truck and associated expenses to be paid for, tools for the workers that have to be paid for, wages and fringe benefits for the workers to be paid for, etc., etc., and what if the section gang spreads their time over several different sections of track, instead of just A to B? Ideally, you have to allocate your expenses across the different sections of track in proportion to the work they do on each one. I haven't even mentioned yet signal maintainers. Or what if a bridge is replaced? Yikes, no wonder some railroads simply take their overall system-wide engineering expense and divide it by all the car loads to get a cost per mile per car or some other usable number. Is your head spinning yet? Here is another rabbit hole. How do you determine what to pay for the locomotives and freight cars on the train? Freight car expense for foreign cars is easy. They all have an hourly charge you are paying the car owner, plus a mileage charge. Privates may or may not have a mileage charge to also pay. But how much do you allocate for a system car, that is, a car you own? Figure the cost of a new car divided by 40 or 50 years of service, and add in a number for running maintenance and possibly a rebuild during its lifetime. So maybe, say, somewhere in the $20 to $30 a day range. This exhibits another principle. A car sitting around is building up cost that goes against the move. Let's say a delay happens and the car takes 
four additional days over and above the cycle time used when the rate was set. You have added 80 to $120 of car costs to the move, which reduces the move's profitability. Now, the weird thing about this allocation toward car cost is the 20 to $30 a day per car you are allocating does not go into the bank and get saved up over a 40-year period so as to be available to purchase a new car when one is needed. On the one hand, it is kind of a virtual number. But on the other hand, if you don't take car cost into account, you are not determining the true cost of any given move. And when it comes time to order 50 or 100 new cars at over 100 grand per car, you are talking serious money you need to have. Then there are the overhead or fixed costs that have nothing to do with a car's movement but still have to be allocated across all the moves, such as the cost of the headquarters building and the cost of the employees that work in departments, such as human resources, the IT people and the computers, the sales and marketing people, etc. Going back to our car moving from A to B, let's say a local switch job pulled it from industry at A and brought it back to the yard. The expense of the handling of the car by that train has to be accounted for. And the cost of the car to be handled through the yard at A has to be determined. So all the expenses of operating the yard at A have to be determined and divided by the cars handled to get a per car cost for yard A to handle a car. And so it continues as the car moves down the line on other trains and through other yards. It obviously takes a powerful computer program to gather all the cost inputs and slice and dice them to obtain any given car's cost to move across the railroad. Each railroad usually has their own proprietary system designed in-house. At Wisconsin Central, we used a system developed by Rebe and Associates. We supplied them with our data and they did the slicing and dicing and created a program for our use. You know the old railroad joke? We lose a dollar on every car, but we make it up in volume? Well, there actually is a little truth to that. As shown, increase your train length and you drive down the cost per car. So a car that was moving at a loss may now be profitable, albeit barely. The cost per car concept comes into play with branch lines. Let's say, hypothetically, you have a branch line and the train runs once a week and handles 10 cars. Let's say marketing determines that one of the cars is moving at a loss, so they raise the rate. The customer shifts the truck because the rail cost is now too high. The train now has nine cars and the expense to run it is basically unchanged, maybe just a tad less fuel consumed by the engine. So the same expenses are now divided by nine cars instead of 10. The cost per car has now gone up. So a piece of business that had been profitable is now moving at a loss. Marketing raises the rate on this car. The business goes bye-bye. Now we divide the train expense by eight cars. Cost per car goes up again. We have now entered what I call the downward spiral, and it is hard to get out of it. Unfortunately, the marketing people on the large railroad are divorced from the intimate knowledge of the results of their actions. I was once fighting to save a multi-car move that made up a significant portion of a particular branch line's business. The move was almost at cost, and truck rates had kept downward pressure on us from taking any rate increases. Marketing was itching to raise the rates, as they had a mandate to achieve a minimum profit ratio on all business, and this move was clearly below it. The mindset was, if we lose the business, no problem, as it wasn't making money for us anyway. And if we keep the business, great. A win-win either way. I pleaded we had to retain the business because I feared if we lost it, the downward spiral would begin. Marketing's reply was, 
I am only concerned with my business. I can't be concerned with someone else's business. Thus the problem with making decisions in isolation and not considering the bigger picture. Oh, and I did win my battle. Marketing agreed to gradually bring the rate up each year. Another time this concept came into play was with a parallel line that was out of service. Various public stakeholders wanted to see it put back in service. To justify their argument, they pointed out that traffic that was now moving circuitously could use the line as a shortcut. True, however, my analysis showed they would be short trains, something like 20 to 30 cars a day. The traffic, although circuitous, was currently moving in large trains. Thus, the cost per car would increase significantly on the small train taking the shortcut. Rate increases were a possibility. And removing cars from the existing trains would increase the cost per car for the remaining cars on those trains. There is a temptation to say, you know, we are running the train anyway, and it has capacity, so let's price this move just to cover the variable costs. <sighs> Shoot, I forgot to explain variable and fixed costs. Okay, variable costs vary with business levels. As rail traffic increases or decreases, so does the number of trains operated, which means the number of workers out working, locomotives in use, fuel consumed, etc., will vary. You absolutely have to cover variable costs. Then come fixed costs, which I mentioned earlier. These costs do not vary with business levels. The headquarters building and its associated expenses will still be there, whether traffic is up or down. Ideally, the rate on a move will cover both variable and fixed costs. However, the rate on a given move may cover variable costs, but only a portion of its share of the fixed costs allocated to it. The move still has value. By absorbing all the variable costs, it is one more car helping to decrease the cost per car for everyone and it is making a dent in the fixed costs. The costing people used to say even one dollar over variable cost is worthwhile. Okay, back to my ramble. Should you price below your ideal threshold level to obtain additional traffic using the rationale the train is running anyway and it has capacity for more traffic? Well again, what is the big picture? Do all the yards that will move through have capacity for additional business? Do the other trains that will move on have capacity? Sometimes there is the philosophy to not do it. Because what happens if additional, fully profitable business is found, but now there is no train capacity anymore because the marginal business took up the last of it? I think this is enough for now. As said, I always found costing fascinating. You would think, because it involves numbers and calculations, the topic would just be a straightforward analysis, but you get into philosophical discussions. For instance, can car costs be excluded? Car costs are a significant portion of a car's movement cost. At Wisconsin Central, we successfully attracted a number of log moves, but the costing the rate was based on sometimes did not include car replacement costs. For instance, we had obtained a number of 52-foot bulkhead flat cars at scrap price, which had been obsoleted by the shift of lumber to the 73-foot center beam flat cars. We spent a few thousand dollars per car to equip them with stakes, so the total outlay was considered minimal, creating the mega log haulers. And it was felt when cars wore out and replacement cars were eventually needed, the same could be done. And in other cases, we simply priced to meet the market, meaning whatever it took to capture the move from trucks. But I am starting down yet another rabbit hole. Well, we'll call it quits for now. I hope this has been educational. Here you can subscribe and also link to other videos. Thank you. Bye for now.